Two and a half thousand years ago, this place in northern India was the site of a great event that was to change the lives of millions of people down through the ages and across the world. An event that continues to have an effect on the world and on people today. What occurred here at Bodh Gaya in northern India brought the great religion we know as Buddhism into being. In the 6th century BCE, this was a quiet, woodland place, visited only by wandering holy men, seekers after the truth. One day, a man called Siddhartha came here, chose a tree, and sat under it to meditate. He was searching for the answer to the question of why there is old age, sickness, death, and suffering in the world. We don't know exactly how long he sat under that tree, deeper and deeper in meditation, but eventually he achieved the state we call enlightenment. He now knew the answer to his question and had found the way to be completely happy, peaceful, kind and free. He was no longer Siddhartha, the wandering holy man, but had become the Buddha, the one who is awake to the truth. From its birthplace at Bodh Gaya, the practice of Buddhism flourished throughout India and spread into Sri Lanka and other countries of Southeast Asia, as well as China, Tibet and Japan. Now, Buddhism has also come to the West. At many of the Buddhist holy sites, there are ruins, the evidence of a tradition that was once practiced by a third of the world's population. These holy sites are still an important focus for Buddhists today. For many centuries, people have traveled to this spot where the Buddha gained enlightenment to bring gifts, prostrate, meditate, pray, light candles and worship. These pilgrims come from many different countries. Some of them live in parts of the world not traditionally thought of as Buddhist, but where the practice of Buddhism is grown. It is not always easy to tell who is a Buddhist. From the outside, they can appear very different. Some wear yellow robes, some wear red robes, others wear Western dress. Some shave their heads, others have long hair. There are men, women, and children. So what is a Buddhist? A Buddhist is anyone who follows the teaching of the Buddha. This is the Manchester Buddhist Centre. For the past two years, Buddhists have been renovating this warehouse near the city centre, turning it into one of the largest urban Buddhist centres in Europe. Sahaja is a Western Buddhist and an artist who works in metal. What the Buddhist says is everybody can be like him. Everybody on the planet can develop or be like what he is, you know, yet develop certain qualities like um, wisdom and love and compassion. And you need to be quite fearless. You can come from anywhere and be a Buddhist. It's not like you have to be a certain type of person. You know, you can be rich, you can be poor, you can be any race, you can be any class. It doesn't matter where you come from or what age you are or what sex you are. Or... So Buddhism is a very universal thing. It's a way of life. You take the Buddha as a, an example of what you can be, or what everybody can be. The Buddha is important to me because he represents... Um, he basically did it, as it were. He went out there and... Uh, did his thing and got enlightened. Who was the Buddha? The man whose life has had such an effect on millions of people, whose teachings people all over the world continue to follow. Siddhartha Gautama, the person who was to become the Buddha, was born in a country we now call Nepal. 
King Sudodana, his father, was the wealthy ruler of the Shakya clan, and the young prince was brought up in great comfort and luxury. Shortly after Siddhartha was born, his father was visited by a wise man called Asita. Asita foretold that the baby prince would grow up to be either a great king, like his father, or a great holy man. Now this worried the king. He wanted Siddhartha to follow in his footsteps, to become a great ruler. He didn't want him to live a religious life. He had the future all planned out for his son. The king decided that the best thing to do was to make sure his son had such a comfortable life that he would never want anything else. He provided his son with everything he could possibly wish for and also gave orders that the prince should be shielded from anything that might upset or worry him. People who were old or ill were not allowed into the palace. And so it was that Prince Siddhartha grew up surrounded by luxuries untroubled by any of the unpleasant things of life. When he was still a young man, he was married to the beautiful Princess Yashodara, and they had a baby son. Life should have been perfect, but somehow Siddhartha wasn't entirely happy. Despite having everything he could wish for, his life seemed empty and rather pointless, and the luxurious palace felt almost like a prison. One day, despite his father's orders that he should stay inside the palace grounds, he decided to go out into the nearby city. Prepare my horse and chariot, he called to Chanda, his chariot driver. I want to visit Kapilavastu. And so Siddhartha left the confines of the palace and went into the city. They hadn't gone very far when they came across an old man shuffling across the road. His back was bent, and his eyes were dim. His hair and his teeth had fallen out, and he looked weary and frail. Stop the chariot, called the prince. He looked at the old man. What has happened to this man? He asked Chanda. Why, he's just very old, replied the chariot driver. You may be young and healthy now, but everyone eventually grows old and loses their strength. Siddhartha was shocked. Take me back to the palace, he said. But the prince's restlessness didn't go away, and it wasn't long before he set off again for the city. This time, as they drove along, Siddhartha saw a pale and wasted figure lying by the roadside, groaning in pain. Stop the chariot, said the prince. He looked at the sick person. What's wrong with that woman? he asked Chanda. She's ill, replied the chariot driver. Unfortunately, no one escapes sickness. Everyone gets ill at some time in their life. Again, Siddhartha was shocked at what he'd seen and returned to the palace. But the prince could not settle, and it wasn't long before he asked Chanda to take him to the city again. This time, as they drove along, they saw a dead man being carried through the streets in a funeral procession. Again, Siddhartha asked Chanda to stop the chariot, and he watched as the sad procession passed slowly by. Death has come, said Chanda. Young or old, rich or poor, everyone has to die sometime. Silently, the prince returned to the palace. King Sudodina had tried to hide all the unpleasant aspects of life from the prince. But in fact, no one can be protected from old age, sickness, and death. These sights made a huge impact on Prince Siddhartha. They set him thinking, and he couldn't ignore the questions they raised in his mind. These sights are all around us today, if we look. We can see the same things that Siddhartha saw. There is sickness and old age, even death, as well as many other signs of suffering. Yet it is hard to really acknowledge the suffering in the world. Often we try not to notice, or we distract ourselves so that we do not have to think about it.
Siddhartha could not ignore what he had seen. He wanted to know why there is old age, sickness and death. Why everyone has to suffer unhappiness at some point in their life. Was there an escape from this seemingly inevitable suffering? How could he find an answer? For one last time, Siddhartha asked Chanda to drive the chariot into the city. This time, what he saw was quite different. There, walking calmly through the crowd, was a man dressed only in rags and carrying a begging bowl. The prince was struck by his calm and peaceful appearance. Who is this man? who seems so at peace with himself, asked the prince. That is a wandering holy man, a truth seeker, explained Chanda. They have few possessions and no home, but live in the forest or wander from place to place. And yet he looks so happy, thought Siddhartha. Perhaps that is the way for me to find an answer to my questions. Siddhartha knew that if he stayed in his comfortable palace, he would easily become distracted from his search. Finding the answer to his questions was so important to him that he decided to take a very brave step. He decided to leave his comfortable life and his secure future, to go forth from all that he had known and set out on a quest. The king, however, had noticed that his son seemed restless and dissatisfied. He didn't want him to leave, so he made doubly sure that the prince wanted for nothing and, just in case, gave orders for the guard on the palace gates to be increased. One beautiful moonlit night, the prince resolved to go. He got up as quietly as he could and tiptoed over to where his wife and baby son lay sleeping. It wasn't easy for him to leave them, but he knew that they would be well cared for and that Eventually, they would understand the importance of what he was doing. Silently, he bade them farewell. As arranged, the faithful Chanda had Siddhartha's favourite horse saddled and made ready. Nothing stirred. Everyone in the palace was asleep. Silently, they crept through the moonlit courtyards to the great gate. Even the horse's hooves hardly made a sound. Look! Even the guards are asleep, said Chanda. How strange. And they pushed open the great gate, mounted the horse and rode out into the night. They rode for several hours and at last caught sight of a river glinting in the moonlight. It marked the border of his father's kingdom. Beyond it spread the jungle, dark and unknown. I must soon cross the river and go alone into the jungle, thought Siddhartha. He felt afraid. At the river, the pair dismounted. Taking his sword, Siddhartha cut off his hair, exchanged his rich clothes for the mud-stained rags of a wanderer and gave his rings and ornaments to Chanda. Please take these back to my father, he said. Tell him I love and respect him. I know how much he wanted me to be king after him, but I have a greater duty to follow. Chanda, with tears in his eyes, watched as Siddhartha crossed the river and disappeared into the darkness. For seven years, Siddhartha lived the life of a mendicant. He spent time with different teachers, learning what they had to teach him. He was a good student and learned well. But in spite of this, he realized that their teachings did not get to the bottom of the problem of sadness and suffering. Some people thought that living an ascetic life and subjecting your body to great hardship was the way to find out about the truth of things. So Siddhartha tried this method. He sat out under the midday sun, surrounded by blazing fires. He reduced his food to one grain of rice a day and grew so thin that if he put his hand on his stomach, he could feel his backbone. He became well known for these practices and had five disciples who practiced the ascetic life with him. But he discovered that living like this was not the answer. 
I am almost starved to death, he thought, and so weak that I can't do anything successfully, but I am still no nearer the truth. Siddhartha was not afraid to admit that he had made a mistake. He took some food and began to care for his body again. Then he remembered an incident from his childhood. He recalled how one day, as he had sat in the cool shade of a rose apple tree, his mind had become delightfully clear and that he was able to understand things easily. Perhaps that was the way he should try now. He found a beautiful, quiet place near a river, chose a tree and sat down under it to meditate. I shall not move from this spot until I have discovered the answer, he vowed, no matter how long it takes. No one knows just how long Siddhartha sat there in ever deeper meditation. But there came a time, just as the sun rose, when a great change came over him and he knew that he had achieved his goal. Through his own efforts, he had seen deeply into the nature of how things really are. That experience had changed him so utterly that he was no longer an ordinary human being. He was totally free. He was completely peaceful, happy and compassionate. He had become enlightened. He had become a Buddha. The word Buddha means one who is awake, awake to the truth. So what was the great truth that Siddhartha Gautama woke up to? What was it that he understood as he sat on the bank of a river meditating? Buddhists believe it is only by becoming enlightened ourselves that we can really understand what enlightenment is. Ideas and words can only point the way. They believe that in this newfound wisdom, the Buddha understood that everything is constantly changing, that nothing stays the same or lasts forever. He saw that all things are interdependent, ceasing to exist when conditions change. This is true both of ourselves and of other people, of our belongings and the world around us. It is even true of the stars. Nothing in the universe lasts forever. He understood that although this is the way the world really is, we don't want it to be like this. Instead, we live our lives expecting things to last. We want things to be permanent, and when they turn out to be impermanent, we suffer and are unhappy. Motivated by compassion, the Buddha wanted to help others understand what he had understood so that they, too, could be free from suffering and unhappiness. But was it possible for him to communicate to others what he had realized? As he sat under the Bodhi tree, he looked out over the world. In his mind's eye, he could see a pool. It was full of lotuses. Some of the lotuses were still submerged in the mud at the bottom. Others were beginning to grow upwards through the water. Some of the flowers had reached the surface and, standing clear of the water, were opening in the sunlight. The Buddha knew that all beings have the potential for enlightenment. He could also see that people were in various stages of development. Some, like the lotus buds, were just beginning to grow. Others, like the lotuses reaching towards the sun, were ready and would be able to hear the truth and understand for themselves. And so the Buddha resolved to let others benefit from his newfound wisdom. He would teach what he had discovered to anyone who was willing to listen. The image of the Buddha is recognized all over the world. To find out about its symbolism and what it means to Buddhists, we visit Yasho Mitra, who teaches at the North London Buddhist Centre. Here we have some lotus flowers, which um, you would expect to smell really lovely. But in fact, they don't. They smell quite strange, because the reason is that they're not real lotus flowers. They're made of cloth. The reason for that is that we don't get lotus flowers in this country. They don't grow here. But we do get Buddha figures. And here we have Buddha figure here in London. 
Now this figure, you can see straight away, is not uh, perhaps like your ordinary Buddha figure. You know, it's represented as a Westerner. You know, he actually looks a bit more like a Westerner. And the reason for that is it's very important that we should understand, that we should see and be able to feel that we can become enlightened too. You know, it's not something that's limited to somebody who lives in China or Japan or India. We can do it, whether you're English or whatever. You know. So this figure is made to look a bit more like a Westerner. And I want to tell you some things about the figure. Most Buddha figures sit in what's known as the full lotus position. So he's cross-legged, and each foot is resting on the opposite thigh. This, as I said, is known as the full lotus. And the idea is that it's a bit like a lotus flower. You know, lotus flower is a symbol of uh, spiritual development, of un unfolding, you know, unfolding your potential. So that's what's happening in this position. It's like opening. It supports the rest of him. It supports his experience. It supports, actually, who he is. And he's enlightened. Let me look at the hands. Well, his hands are actually quite relaxed. They're resting one on top of the other. Uh, on his feet. Sometimes, though, you get a Buddha whose hands are in a different position. You might find a Buddha figure that's like this. If his hand is in this position, it means that he's teaching. Now, this is the mudra of teaching. So he's communicating his understanding of reality, of things as they are. Sometimes you'll find his hand in this position, which is the mudra of fearlessness. Simply means that he's not afraid. He'll sit there can face anything. The Buddha has, has faced everything. You know? There's nothing that scares him, nothing at all. On other figures, you get the other hand in this position, which is the mudra of generosity. You know, he's reaching out as if to help and to give you know, to us, to help us. So it's that acting out of kindness and compassion. So with the two together, you have fearlessness and generosity. He's strong. You know? He's, he's powerful, but he's also open and kind and interested in us. What else can I say? Well, let me talk a bit about his face. You can see that he's very still and very focused. You know, his eyes, looking down, straight ahead, unwavering. You know. Wave my hand in front of his face and nothing happens. He's completely focused and concentrated. His mouth is supposed to have a very, very slight smile. You know, it's like it's representing the fact that he's spontaneous, he's playful. Actually, he's friendly. You know, he's not just a concentrated, focused man. He's actually a, a friendly guy who wants to come out and meet people. You know, he's generous. Sometimes, on a Buddha figure, you'll get a mark on the forehead, just here, which represents the third eye. Or what is the third eye? You might have heard of it. Well, what it represents is that the Buddha sees not only with both eyes, but he sees with his mind, he sees really clearly, he sees everything, he understands everything. Mm -hmm. Similarly, these great big earlobes, which I don't know if you can see them clearly, but you know, they're much bigger than mine or yours, represent the Buddha's wisdom. And if I put my head next to his, you probably notice that something that I haven't got, <laughs> which he has, uh, something missing. Well, I'm not enlightened, the Buddha is. This here is an Ushnisha. And that represents the enlightened consciousness of the Buddha, which, which means that, well, what he has understood, what he sees, what he experiences, is far beyond what an ordinary human being experiences and sees. And if you take in the whole figure, from the legs, through the feet, the hands, the upper body, the head, you get a sense of calmness. You get a sense of the stillness of the Buddha's mind. You know, that's represented in his body, the way he's sitting here. Like I said already, he doesn't move, you know, push him and nothing happens. But he's also very strong, he's got broad shoulders. Well, not all Buddha figures are muscly. This one is, got strong biceps, he's really, you know, thick set. He gives you a sense of power, you know, which is spiritual power. It's like his power within. This guy is really strong, not necessarily physically, but mentally and emotionally, he's strong. He's no pushover, and nobody can push him around. So you get this combination of qualities of calmness and stillness and serenity with power, with strength. You know? Quite a combination. And there it is. That's the, the Buddha figure that's here. 
in our shrine here in North London, giving us all a sense of what we can become, you know, the fact that we can become enlightened too, like the Buddha did. The Buddha sat in the shade of the trees on the bank of the river. The sun was high overhead and the air hot and dry. It was now seven weeks since his enlightenment here under the Bodhi tree. It will soon be the rainy season. I will set out tomorrow to find my old ascetic friends. Perhaps they will understand what I have understood, he thought. The next day he began to walk to Sarnath which lay a hundred miles away to the west. On the way, a truth seeker called Upaka saw the Buddha coming towards him. There was something about the approaching figure that made Upaka stop dead in his tracks. Here was someone utterly different from anyone he had ever seen. Upaka's first thought was, this is not a human being. So he immediately asked, what are you? Are you a forest spirit? The Buddha simply replied, no. Well, said Upaka, are you an angel? The Buddha again said, no. You must be a god then. The Buddha shook his head. That is strange, thought Upaka. He must be a human being after all. Are you a human being? Once again, the Buddha had to reply, no. You're not a human being, or a god, or a spirit, or an angel. So what are you? I am none of these, Upaka, for I am beyond all those levels of being. Therefore, I am a Buddha. This was all too much for poor Upaka. May it be so, friend, he replied, shaking his head, and he went off down a side track. Some days later, the Buddha arrived in Sarnath and made his way to the deer park in search of his five old friends. They weren't pleased to see him. They had given him up as a failure when he had stopped fasting. Here comes Siddhartha, the one who went back to the easy life. Well, let him come if he wants to, said another, but he needn't think we'll pay him respect, just ignore him. But as the Buddha drew near, they couldn't help themselves. They too could see he was different. There was something impressive about him to which they could not help responding. Even his skin shone with a golden glow. Immediately, they offered him a seat, greeted him, 
and took his bowl. The Buddha came straight to the point. Listen, friends, I have finally found the answer. I have come to show you how you too can break free. The five ascetics did not believe him. How can that be? You did not win your quest even while you endured those hardships, fasting, sitting out under the blazing sun. How can you have broken free now that you have given up trying? But the Buddha persisted. He reasoned with them. He argued with them and, in the end, he managed to persuade them at least to listen to what he had to say. It was the full moon day of June, July. The rains had just begun and throughout the months of the rainy season, they talked, they discussed and they meditated. Then, at last, one of the five, Kondanya, suddenly jumped up, exclaiming, I can see it too. The Buddha was overjoyed. Kondanya knows. Kondanya understands. And one by one, the others began to see the truth for themselves. By the end of the rainy season, there were six enlightened beings in the world. This is where that great event took place two and a half thousand years ago. This is Sarnath in North India. Over the centuries, monasteries and monuments were built here. Now only ruins remain. Buddhist pilgrims still come from all around the world to see the very spot where the Buddha first taught the Dharma. The Dharma means the teachings of the Buddha. The symbol for the Dharma is a wheel. And that full moon day when the Buddha started his teaching is known as the first turning of the wheel of the Dharma. This day is now one of the major Buddhist festivals known as Dharma Day, the day on which the Buddha began to teach. So what was it that the Buddha actually taught during that rainy season that enabled his friends to understand the truth for themselves? His first Dharma teaching is known as the Four Noble Truths. The teaching was based on an Indian medical formula well known to doctors. This is a Buddhist boys' hostel in Pune, central India. Every few weeks, Dr. Kadam comes to check the health of all the boys. Most of them are in good health, but there's always some who feel a little out of sorts. Being ill is part of life. Simply understanding that one's life is not always going to be happy is to understand the first noble truth. The first noble truth says that our experience of life is unsatisfactory because although at times things go well, they can also go wrong. At some point, life involves suffering. Dr. Kadam has to find what the boy's illness is. She does some checks and asks questions about his symptoms. Eventually, she will come to a decision about what is the cause of the illness. The Buddha's second noble truth is like this. He says that there is a cause for our feeling dissatisfied in life and that the cause is craving. We all have this tendency to want more and more we're rarely happy with what we've got. There's always something else that we need to make things just right. Want, want, want. Suffering is caused by craving. The third stage of the medical formula states that good health is possible. That's why, back at the hostel, Dr. Kadam is here. She knows that these boys could be healthy. And that's like the third noble truth. The Buddha pointed out that it is possible to be completely free from craving and to experience perfect happiness. This is the state of enlightenment. Dr. Kadam can now begin to give her patient some practical advice on how to get well again. She'll probably give him some medicine. 
The Buddha's fourth noble truth is the medicine. Just as Dr. Kadam's medicine will make the boys healthy, the Buddha's Dharma tells us about a way of life that can free us from craving and lead to real happiness. This way of life is known as the Noble Eightfold Path. So, let's just recap the Four Noble Truths. Number one, we all experience dissatisfaction in life. Number two, dissatisfaction is caused by craving. Number three, perfect happiness is freedom from craving. Number four, following the Noble Eightfold Path leads to happiness. Sanjay has his medicine. Now he has to take it. From the earliest days of Buddhism, following the Noble Eightfold Path has been the central feature of Buddhist practice. That's why the wheel of the Dharma has eight spokes, or multiples, of eight. The symbol shows just how important this path is in Buddhism. In fact, you could say that Buddhism is this path. These monks at Rizong Monastery in Ladakh live their lives by this teaching. Every moment of their day is guided by the steps of the path. They live in a traditionally Buddhist region in very simple surroundings. But is it possible for Buddhists in today's busy Western world to live by the Noble Eightfold Path? Philippe is a Buddhist. He lives in Manchester, England. Like Prince Siddhartha, before he became the Buddha, I've got loads of questions. What is life all about? Is my life worth living? Is there anything I can do about the suffering in the world? These were the questions that Siddhartha set out to find the answers to. I've got a strong desire in my heart to find out too. I suppose I see what Prince Siddhartha saw before he set out on his quest. And happiness and suffering are everywhere. And I too want to respond. But I want to find a way that will really change things. I've tried pressure groups, politics and all that, but they only got me so far. Like many of my Buddhist friends, I'm practicing the Noble Eightfold Path. The first step on the path is called right vision. To actually practice Buddhism at all, I have to have some vision or idea that there's something worth working towards. The Buddha taught that real happiness can be achieved by our own efforts. The Buddha image in my bedroom is the first thing I see when I wake up. It reminds me that, like the Buddha, I can become happier, wiser, and more compassionate. I can gain enlightenment. That's my goal, my vision. So this is my first step on the path. Next comes right emotion. Sometimes when I wake up in the mornings, I don't even want to get out of bed, let alone make the effort to follow a path. I'm just too grumpy. So what do I do? I can't just pull the quilt over my head and pretend I haven't woken up. I need something to get me motivated. It's no good wanting to get enlightenment in my head if in my heart I can't be bothered. If my heart's not really into it, I just can't get going. Well, one way I can motivate myself is to do some meditation. Another way I can inspire myself is to read some Dharma. There are hundreds of books of the Buddha's teachings to choose from. Cease to do evil, learn to do good, purify the heart. This is the teaching of the Buddha. 
better than a hundred years lived in laziness is one single day lived with great effort. So I do have ways to help myself get started. Relaxing a bit in the community, having a bit of time off. The third step of the Eightfold Path is right speech. It's a crucial step. We have a very strong effect on the people in our lives through our speech and communication. But talking comes so easy to us. We can chatter on all day without really thinking about what effect you might have. Practicing right speech means speaking truthfully and kindly. If I tell the truth, especially when it's not easy, I develop honesty and fearlessness. By being truthful, I do myself honor. The more I look at my speech, the more I realize what a challenge it is to be really honest and always kind. It's so easy to forget. The Noble Eightfold Path is a Buddhist practice that covers every aspect of our lives. After speech comes right action. We do things all day. Everything we do is an action, so everything we do should be right action. So what, you might ask, are right actions? Buddhism says that the key to right action is intention. Why am I doing what I'm doing? Behind every action is a state of mind. So what state of mind am I in right now? If I catch myself being greedy, I know I'm in a negative state of mind. But I can choose to act differently and so practice right action. If I want to do more than practice Buddhism in my spare time, I have to give serious consideration to the fifth step of the path, right livelihood. Livelihood means the work that I do. I earn my living by helping run this printing business in Glasgow. Hello, printer and design. The Buddha gave clear guidelines to his followers about the kind of work to avoid. We try to avoid any kind of work that might increase suffering in the world. We don't want to harm the environment, or animals, or humans. So, for example, this means avoiding work involving weapons, tobacco, or alcohol. Instead, we want to find work that might make a more positive contribution to the world. Some of our Buddhist friends do medical or social work. Others are designers, cooks, teachers. Working with fellow Buddhists has other benefits too. It means I'm kept on my toes. It's not so easy to forget the Eightfold Path when your mates are practicing it too. So right livelihood businesses are ideal for Buddhists. Hello, in print and design. So Buddhism is concerned with the development of our minds. The last three steps of the Eightfold Path are about working on our minds. The sixth step is right effort. I can find myself in different states of mind from one moment to the next. So what can I do about this? Buddhism says that our state of mind affects what we can do and how we can do it. You can certainly see that in my yoga class. Can you see any lazy mental states in today's class? So I need to ask myself regularly through the day, what state am I in? Then I can change that by making more effort. I can change how I feel and think. With right effort, I can develop a more positive, brighter outlook. An outlook which in turn helps me with all the other steps on the path. The seventh step on the path is right mindfulness, or right awareness. Often we're not very aware, not aware of how we feel, or aware of what we're doing, or the world around us. If we can become aware, live more in the present moment, our life is transformed. So 
So staying aware of what we are doing, that is focusing our mind on one thing at a time, is a practice that can lead to happier states of mind. Instead of rushing through this job, I can actually slow down and even find enjoyment in what I'm doing. I can see the beauty of the bubbles, hear the swishing of the water. Rather than just wishing I was somewhere else, my mind can be settled and calm. OK, so this is a pretty tough example. But by practicing right awareness, I am making the most of every moment. In my Buddhist community, we begin our day with meditation. This is the eighth step of the Noble Eightfold Path, right meditation. Transforming myself in all these ways is quite a task. I can only do that if I know myself well. Meditation helps me to develop calm and peaceful states of mind, where I can begin to see myself more clearly. I can appreciate my qualities and spot the aspects of myself that still need working on. With the help of meditation, I can gradually progress through ever higher states of mind, nearer and nearer to enlightenment. As with all Buddhists, this is my aim, to become enlightened. That's what this step and all the other steps are about. It may take much effort and many lifetimes to achieve such a transformation, but that's where the path leads. Throughout Buddhist history, there are countless examples of people whose lives have been changed by the Buddha's teaching. This once great column stands in the deer park at Sarnath in northern India. It was built by Ashoka, who was emperor of India about 200 years after the time of the Buddha. It reminds Buddhists of how the Dharma can change the world. Ashoka was a cruel and ambitious ruler. Even though his empire already covered most of what is now India, he wanted to conquer even more kingdoms. I will surely be remembered as a great and fearless king, he thought. With a huge army, he invaded the neighboring kingdom of Kalinga. The Kalingans resisted courageously. The battle raged long and hard, but finally they could not withstand the great army of Ashoka. Many soldiers were taken prisoner, but thousands more lay dead or dying on the battlefield. As Ashoka looked over the battlefield, the scenes of pain and bloodshed suddenly filled his heart with sorrow. So many thousands have died here. So many Kalingans are now homeless. All this suffering was caused by my greed. This cannot be a day of victory for me. From that moment, Ashoka's life began to change. Never again shall I lead my people into war. Instead, I shall become a true follower of the Buddha's teaching. Now, instead of pursuing a life of war and violence, Ashoka put all his energy into following the path of peace, dedicated to the happiness and well-being of all. Soon, hospitals and rest houses were being built. Trees were planted along the kingdom's highways to provide shade for weary travelers. Ashoka's new guidelines, aspects of the Dharma, were carved on rocks and pillars all over the kingdom. Excellent it is to listen to one's father and mother. Excellent is generosity to friends. Excellent it is to abstain from killing living beings. The king wishes men of all faiths to live in his kingdom. Soon missionaries were sent in all directions, to neighboring kingdoms and beyond. Ashoka's own son took Buddhism to Sri Lanka. Not only did people benefit from Ashoka's enthusiasm for the Dharma, the lives of creatures are also precious, he declared. Let us build hospitals for them too. Ashoka later passed laws forbidding the slaughter or wounding of animals throughout the empire. But even more inspiring to the people than the new laws 
and the words of uplift carved on rocks and pillars was the example of their beloved emperor. Never again did he engage in the royal hunt at which he once excelled, and no longer were the famously lavish meat dishes served at the royal table, for Ashoka now became a vegetarian. Instead of imperial silks and jewels, he wore simple robes. Gone too were the expensive tours of the empire. Now Ashoka could be seen on pilgrimage. Ashoka built great stone pillars at all the places associated with the Buddha's life in order to honor the Buddha and his Dharma. On top of the pillar at Sarnath sat four lions supporting the eight-spoked wheel of the Dharma. They now sit in the Sarnath Museum. The lion is a symbol for the Buddha and this statue is now the national symbol of India. The Dharma, or teaching of the Buddha, is said to be like a lion's roar. On the remains of the pillar at Sana, one can still see Ashoka's carved messages. This is the only pillar that still remains intact 2,000 years later. This is Vashali, once a great capital city where the Buddha taught. Ashoka's pillar stands as a reminder of the great courage of the king who made radical changes to his life by adopting and following the Dharma. A man who dared to devote his life to the welfare of all beings. A true follower of the Buddha's Dharma. The Dharma is a rich collection of teachings which anyone can follow. All the teachings of the Dharma lead towards a greater understanding of enlightenment. As the Buddha once said, the Dharma is like a finger pointing to the moon. The aim of all Buddhists is to follow the finger and see the moon for themselves. In the next program, we will continue to explore what the Buddha taught.